What's up? It's episode 91, Pain Points of Wealth, and we're getting mixed emotions from the economy and the stock market as we're in the midst of earnings season. And surprise, surprise, earnings are not looking as bad as Wall Street wanted you to believe. We're going to break it down for you. We're going to give you our view on what's going on with earnings right now, what we see right now with the economy, the labor market, inflationary pressure, everything everyone's talking about. We're going to give you the pain view. And on the tipping point today, we're going to give you a financial independence pop quiz. Can you answer these questions? Are you on your path to financial independence or you need some help? Well, we're going to break it down for you. Check it out. We got a great show. Here's something I just don't understand, right? You've got Jamie Dimon, who is the top CEO of the banking industry in our country, maybe in the world. Uh, he says everything's really good, except he's worried about geopolitical tension, high inflation, consumer confidence, how high rates will go, what the Fed's going to do, what's going on in Ukraine. So in other words, you got this guy, right, who runs the biggest bank in the world, has access to more research than even I could read and anybody could imagine, and he doesn't have any idea what's going to happen in six months. I mean, what's everybody worried about? <laughs> well, Bob, I mean, you know, I think he probably has almost as much information as you. Arguably, I don't think anyone has more information than Bob Payne at his fingertips. <laughs> um, and you go to the weirdest, just as a side here, you go to the weirdest parts of the Internet to get your economic data. And I, sometimes I'm like, where did you find that website? But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, but, yeah, I think, I think the point is it's extremely complex right now. And when you start looking at the headlines, you start reading a lot of the – prognosticators out there everyone always talks with so much certainty like this is definitely going to happen and I think that's problematic because it is complicated and right now there's just so many balls in the air right whether it's the Eastern European conflict whether it's the fact that we still have this hot labor market whether it's the fact that the Fed keeps tightening interest rates and you can go on and on and on but you're right at the end of the day no one really knows and those on Wall Street that love to make you believe they know well I'm pretty skeptical they have any clue. Jeremy Siegel uh, was on this week, and you know he's a great economist. Um, he's also a, a professor of finance at the Wharton School in the, in, at the University of Pennsylvania. And by the way, I was in his office one time, guys, and he had the smallest office I've ever could possibly believe, filled head, you know, floor to, to, to the ceiling with books uh, that I'm sure he read all of them. But you know, he's a big fan of Jerome Powell and the Federal Reserve, and he's been kind of rooting them on to raise interest rates and believes that they will hike. 75 bips next week, but he thinks that they're going to start paying attention to the slowdown in the economy, and the lows could absolutely be behind us already. Now, he doesn't know, but again, you know, he's a smart man, and he knows that Jay Powell is looking at all the tea leaves, looking at all the indicators, and, you know, we might have seen peak inflation. Well, you know, Bob, if, uh, if you're right, I get a, you get a free bowl of uh, soup with that opinion. <laughs> but, you know, I think I – think <laughs> And, you know, it's a good point. I mean, we could hit the lows. And I think what was really indicative last week, um, you know, right before we were recording this, is we did have really good earnings on a, on a Tuesday, and markets went up over 700 points in one day. And it's just a reminder, is sentiment, the market action can change on a dime. And I'd argue here, yeah, maybe we get some more downside in the markets. It's very possible but your bigger risk here probably is we get good news. Like all of a sudden, to your point, Bob, the Fed stops raising interest rates, and all of a sudden you get a huge melt-up in the market. And this is why you don't want to market time, because when that happens, if you're not already invested, and we talked about this week after week, you missed the boat. And I think that's a great reminder what we saw the other day is, man, oh, man, markets can melt up really quickly, and they can come out of the blue, because it was completely unexpected as most market moves are. Well, you know what, right? Going back to what you were saying before about dad being the expert, I was talking to a client of mine the other day and I was talking about what you know, Jerome Powell was saying, you know, what, uh, what the Fed in general was talking about. And they go, well, no, we don't want to know what Jerome Powell has to say. We want to know what Bob has to say. So <laughs> I, think, I think the greater audience uh, is more for what Bob has to say versus what the Fed has to say. Well, judging by our downloads lately, uh, we're definitely getting some traction. So Bob, keep it up, whatever you're doing. It's making this podcast yeah, moving groove. I don't know, guys. The market seems to be like my children. You know, they, they listen, but they don't, add, they don't do what I tell them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd also point out, too, I mean, you know, going back to last week or two weeks ago now um, when this podcast is coming out, 
is you know, we had that high inflation number, right, over 9%, which is extremely high. That's a 40-year high in inflation. And you would think the market would have reacted very poorly to that, but we didn't see that happen. So you know, what that says to me to some extent here is, man, oh, man, we have a lot of bad news priced in. Because if we're talking about it, the media has been talking about it for months now. We've been hearing the word recession every day. At some point, it doesn't have the same, we'll call it like uh, momentum, right? It doesn't really move the needle anymore because a lot of the stuff gets priced in. And at this point, it's probably more bad news than good news that's been priced into the capital markets. Yeah, I mean, when you look at the sentiment, it, it couldn't really get any worse. It's the worst consumer uh, sentiment reading, I think, in history. And we've been through a lot of bad stuff in the last 100 years. You know, I have a chart to show all that if you guys ever want to see it. Um, but, you know, I, I think that the, you know, the, when you have this much negativity, you know, generally any good news is going to spark a gigantic rally. And you know, who knows where that good news is going to come from? It's going to come from Russia. It's going to come from the Federal Reserve. Um, you know, next week, Jerome Powell raises rates 75 basis points, and he says, hey, we're going to take a pause. I'm starting to see things slow down. I'm really happy with, you know, the progress we're making. You know, this market could heat up and take off long before the news actually gets better. You know what? I, I think the Fed, what the Fed's doing is working. I'll give you a great example. Uh, so yesterday, I met with a client of mine, and he's in the scallop fishing business. And one of the things he told me is that the price of scallops – is going down. He thinks it's because people aren't going out to eat as often just because, you know, the price of gas has become prohibitive. Um, you know, just going out in general has become prohibitive. So, you know, I think with the Fed raising rates, it's actually helped our economy and, you know, people aren't spending as much as they were. Well, Bob 101, right? Bob Economics 101 is what cures higher prices? High higher prices. prices. Think about that. Think of all the students had to go to the Wharton School, probably still can't figure that out, but Bob figured it out somehow. <laughs> <laughs> in, the, in the school of hard knocks. Well, we're definitely seeing all the commodity prices come down across the board. Chris, you went out and just bought a, um, a board the other day. You said that was, you know, 500, 600% higher, but because Bitcoin collapsed, now you have these processors that, that are dropping in price. Just another example. That's right. The, um, the, the crypto mining industry is heavily dependent on these things called GPUs, graphical processing units. And the, the big ones are made by NVIDIA and AMD. And, you know, with the price of Bitcoin collapsing, all these really high-end cards are coming on the market that were, you know, two, $3,000 six months ago. Now they're selling for like 1200 bucks. You can get them real cheap. I don't know what I would do with it, but I'm glad it's cheap. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to mine more of that Bob coin. <laughs> Well, that's the thing. I mean, you look at the market, guys. I mean, it's. Um, I, I spoke with a client uh, just the other day, and I said, "Do you have any idea how far down you know the Nasdaq is?" He said, "No." And I said, "It's down over thirty percent." And I said, "And, and the S and P five hundred is down twenty percent." And I said, "Bonds were down, you know, six seven percent." And then you had this disruptive, innovative technology stocks that are down eighty percent and cryptocurrency. And he's like, "Oh my goodness, all oh, that must be horrible." Eighty percent. And I said, yeah, and your portfolio is down 11. And he goes, well, how's that possible? I said, because, you know, the market is really hammering the speculative, high risk, you know, things that don't have value, don't have intrinsic value. They've been punishing those stocks and really kind of wringing out, you know, the speculation in the market, which is ultimately really good. And that's what corrections in bear markets are about. And, you know, I'll tell you, the other thing I've observed, guys, this has really been in a market where retail, you know, private client, what we deal with, are really keeping their heads. I think it's the institutional investor that kind of lost their mind. Yeah. You know, they're they're scrambling to the sidelines. You know, they're like roaches. When you turn on the light, they all <laughs> scramble. Uh, there's lots of them. Um, but And I think they're the ones that are really afraid of the markets. And typically, you know, they underperform the market. Um, maybe this is one of the reasons. Well, it's, it's a great point. Bank of America comes out of a survey, and the recent survey showed that most money managers right now have a higher bond allocation than they do to stocks. The last time that was the case was during the great financial crisis in 2009. And we, of course, we know what happened, right? The market went off to the races uh, from that, those levels, right? The market rebounded hard. Meanwhile, all these money managers were caught with their proverbial pants down because they had their money sitting in bonds as opposed to the stock market. You know, and I talked to a, a client the other day, and that was a question like, hey, if you see this market falling off a cliff here, like, do we need to make some adjustments to the portfolio? And, of course, A, I said, guess what? My crystal ball broke. Sorry, dude. Can't help you. <laughs> uh, but number two, I said no. And like, just like I said before, you know, 
your bigger risk here is we get some good news, right? And the market does turn and you don't want to miss that opportunity. And most of these money managers, they're always behind the eight ball because they get too conservative when you're near the bottom. And I'm not, I'm not calling a bottom here, but it's usually a good sign when the professional money managers uh, have their money on the sidelines. Like that's typically when you're getting pretty close to things turning the other way. So you can always bet on those money managers and make bad decisions. Go figure. Well, meanwhile, you know, dividends are increasing um, and they're being paid. And there's very few times in history where there's actually a decline in dividend yields. But you, know, you take a look at the banking industry. Uh, you know, they, they came out with decent earnings last week. Uh, the stocks are down like the rest of the market. But you have some blue chip banking stocks that are yielding 4%. And those dividends uh, are going to be increased again next year. Uh, as long as the economy continues to grow. And, and it's, uh, you know, when you look at your portfolio, it's not about buy low, sell high. It's about that total return. So when you're sitting in the sidelines, waiting and scratching your head and earning zero on your cash, you know, there's still portfolios that are generating return every day. Remember, every single day, your portfolio generates income. Bonds accrue interest. It's your interest. It's earned. You own it, and your dividends are paid every quarter. And most great quality companies increase their dividend every year. I track it all the time. I got companies that have increased their dividend 60, 70 years in a row now, guys. Yeah, it's, it's remarkable. And again, it's because long-term investing is boring, but it works, right? So these are what you want to consider here. As you are, if you're sitting on the sidelines right now, this is a great buying opportunity. You're hearing it on this podcast first. We're not calling the bottom, but we're going to argue. 12 months from now, you're going to say, I wish I listened to Chris, Ryan, and Bob. They always know what they're talking about. Hey guys, to sum it up, I just we just have to always remember that every day, time passes and markets operate. Neither cares what you think. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 91, Pain Points of Wealth. This is literally what we do every day. Me, Chris, and Bob have a collective 75 years helping individuals just like you with your planning and investing. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially literally at any stage of your journey. But if you want a more hands-on approach and want to get a full review to make sure you're on the right track and you've saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan, Bob, Chris, and I will run for you our total financial master plan. We do them every week with no obligation or charge. If you qualify, we literally go through everything. We'll do a deep dive of every investment you own. In fact, we'll build you your own personalized financial portal, give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial picture. We'll hone in on every single financial issue you have, whether it's an income plan for retirement. Do you have an income plan? How are you going to draw from your portfolio? How do you take Social Security? How do you factor in inflation? We'll put together a full income plan to make sure that you don't run out of money when you finally retire. We're going to look at diversification. Are you getting hit hard here with markets selling off? Are you too aggressive in your portfolio? Do you have a lot of overlap? Or are you sitting in cash, earning nothing, paralysis by analysis as inflation is at a 40-year high, trying to figure out what to do? We're going to give you a full investment game plan, show you how to grow your money, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we're going to look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you products with high fees and tons of tax inefficient investment products. We're going to go through everything that you own. Show how to reduce the cost on your portfolio, optimize your portfolio for taxes, give you our full tax playbook. It's not what you make, it's what you take. And we'll tie it all together in one total financial master plan. Simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan. That's www.paincm.com slash financial plan to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E, having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And we have a very special guest on the show today, my colleague, Bob's colleague, Chris's colleague, certified financial planner at Payne Capital Management, the man with the deepest voice in the industry, potentially, Mr. Aaron Dessen. Aaron, man, great to have you on the show as usual. You, you have that voice for radio, man, or podcasting, I should say. Quite an intro, man. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. You know, it's a little unknown fact that Aaron was actually going to join a, uh, a Barry White cover band, but then uh, Ryan offered him a job. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's a better gig, you know, working at Payne Capital Management or, you know, building out some of those uh, romantic tunes, which, I mean, you could do both really well. Let's, let's face it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, you know, we want to discuss today, Aaron, on the show is I wanted to give our listeners or our watchers, if it's on YouTube, a financial independence pop quiz. You know, we, we manage over 2000 clients and I thought these are some questions that you need to answer. And if you can answer them correctly, probably says you're closer to being financially secure 
If you're like, I can't really answer that question that well, then you probably need to do more planning. And the first question with mostly anyone who walks into our firm that you really want to ask yourself is, do you know how much it costs to fund your lifestyle? Um, well, in my experience, right, you know, most people really have no idea. Actually, anecdotally, I was talking to a, to a prospective client the other day who wrote in the email, I actually have no effing clue what my expenses are. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's a very emphatic uh, no. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, it, it, it's not that hard to figure out. If you know what your take-home income is, we can figure out, you know, what your rate of savings is and kind of back into it. And when we get to that number at the end of the day, most people are pretty surprised. Well, Aaron, I think the big problem is, you know, it's like you can figure out what your number is today, but what's going to be in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, you know, with this insidious hidden tax we call inflation, especially now where inflation's running rampant, it's running hot right now. Yeah, and it's a, it's a buzz kill because when you look at it, you extrapolate it out. I mean, good rule of thumb is every 20 years, you're double what you need today. Now, I think just to do the same thing, you need double. So that's a very daunting number to look at. And secondly, you know, to your point, Aaron, like this guy has no effing clue what his expenses are. It's hard to sit down. We don't want to look at what we actually spend money on because we know there's a lot of frivolous expenses in there that you're like, oh, I can't believe I spent money on that. But you do end up finding your surprise, like, oh, wait, maybe it's not as bad as I thought it was. Yeah, and, you know, the other thing, too, is, like, the clients are most surprised about when we go through and run projections is what you show them what they're spending in, you know, 20, 30 years from now. So they may be spending 100 grand a year today, but by the time they're 90, you know, they're spending four or $500,000 a year. So you really do have to account for that, uh, as Dad put it, that insidious tax. Well, here's the, the biggest surprise. Um, when someone who doesn't know what their budget is they typically just run hard their whole life, right? They work hard, they save, they invest. But the end result is they, they take way more risk than they need to in order to achieve their financial goals because they never know, do I have enough or not enough? Do I have too much risk, not enough risk? Um, hey, look, I'm like we're like batting a, almost a 1,000 on every new client we've ever onboarded. When we ask them for a copy of their financial plan or even a wealth projection, less than one or 2% even have one. So unless you know, you're gonna end up taking more risk and 99% of you take more risks than necessary than, it, than you need to. And you know, it's not a problem when markets going up, but what about when you have markets like now? Well, right, that is the problem because you could have saved a ton of money, worked your tail off, and then only to see it literally start just to appear when you have a market correction like this. And that's just like a bad place to be. So it's not only about creating that wealth, but it's like managing it properly, right? And managing risk is, we know guys, and we've experienced this through so many markets, is really half the battle. I always say it's not what you make on the upside, like when you have these big booming bull markets, it's what you don't lose on the downside. Ask anybody who owns a cryptocurrency today, they can probably attest to that you know, pretty, uh, pretty acutely right now. Yeah, that's why I, I always love evidence-based portfolios. You know, there's evidence that this stock market is not going to go to zero because it hasn't done that for hundreds of years. But I really need to own crypto right now. Like, really, why? Right? I mean, what's the whole point of putting your money in things that have no evidence of performance? And remember, guys, there are no new errors. Right? So history repeats. Markets are easy. All you have to do is be invested in real stuff. And uh, the rest takes care of itself. So I guess what you're trying to say is it's not different this time. It's never different, Chris. It's never different. Four most dangerous words, according to Sir John Templeton. It's different this time. Well, here's, a, here's another one. Um, is what does your net worth need to be uh, before you can live off your portfolio? I mean, that seems to be a question that, uh, that I personally get a lot from clients. Um, and, you know, the only way to really figure that out is doing a comprehensive financial plan. Figure out, first and foremost, the first thing we talked about is what do you spend? I think that's the most important thing. Well, my favorite clients are the ones that keep putting that goalpost further and further away, which means they save more and more. Uh, in spite of the fact I show them a projection they could have retired 10 years ago. Um, they're like, well, no, it, uh, we changed again. Our goalposts are moving. So, that, Which is not good, I think, for most of us. But for some clients, that's not a bad thing. And I always love working with those folks because they just keep sending me more money to invest. Well, you know what, Dad? I'm a little confused. You know, I was looking at your projection the other day that Ryan did for you, and I noticed that uh, every time I look at it, it goes out another three, four years. Like, you were supposed to retire like 20 years ago, I think. <laughs> well, he tells me I am retired. I just haven't signed the paperwork, Chris. I, I'm, I'm just confused. <laughs> the paper, paperwork's in the mail, Bob. But Aaron, you know, you, you deal with a lot of clients at our firm. And, you know, what do you find when people come in the door to sit down with you? Um, you know, is it like, hey, I need to get this certain number to feel financially secure? I mean, what is it that you find that that takes people from like, man, oh, man, I am like, 
I feel like I am completely blind to what I'm doing, to feeling comfortable and feeling they have a plan in place and they can sleep at night. Right. I mean, I think it really does start with that planning process. You know, I was talking to a couple in their 60s um, that was invested, you know, like 30 year olds. They were all in, in small, mid, large cap stocks. I think it was like 90 percent equities. And we sit down and we're running a plan for them. And they're like, oh, wow, this is really cool. I've never done this before. Their projections look fantastic. They don't need to be taking any additional risk. And when you show people that, I think it really gives them peace of mind and they can sleep at night. I remember talking to a lot of folks in the spring and summer of 2020 that were calling us just for that reason, because they were invested, you know, almost all in equities and all in stocks and their portfolios were dropping 30 and 40 percent. And, you know, they don't want to be living like this anymore, um, you know, at or approaching retirement. Well, and that's what happens, right? Like a lot of people come in the door because it's just like, I'm tired of going through these market cycles. It's like you forget about them when the market's going up, but then you get a big sell off like we've had this year. And all of a sudden you're reminded of how painful and tumultuous and like every year that you're older, close to retirement or retired, it just becomes that much more painful to go through times like this. Yeah, it's like you don't want that bear market to be the indicator that you're taking too much risk in your portfolio. I mean, you want to find that out ahead of time. You want to find out at out in a financial review with, you know, with someone like Aaron, you know, where you can actually sit down and, and when things are good, really understand how much risk you're taking, not when the market's down. And then you have that lifetime wild card, right? How much longer are you going to live? Are going to live longer? Most of us are going to live longer than our parents. And what's your health going to be? And what are your health cost, more importantly, going to be if you live longer and as a result, you experience you know, a lot of other health issues. That's the wild card that a lot of folks yeah. don't prepare for. Well, now I'm just bummed out, Bob, because <laughs> now it's like, okay, I've got to account for inflation, which means I need double the money, you know, double the income I need today in my portfolio. Now I got a healthcare cost, which if we live longer, could be another 200,000 plus coming out of my portfolio. But I will say this, and Aaron, I know you do this with your numbers for, for the clients you work with, is like you can model this out and you should model it out because if you model it out, you can see where you stand. But if you don't know where you stand, man, oh man, that makes it just a torturous life, you know, trying to like always worry about the back of your mind, like is my portfolio going to fall off a cliff? Am I going to run out of money? You know, Chris, it's no different than sailing your sailboat, right? If you don't make course adjustments, next thing you know, you end up in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean stranded. So you've got to have a, a GPS, a financial GPS, to make sure that you're making smart decisions, that you understand what you own. Most importantly, you know why you own it. That's always a big joke I have with prospective clients or clients who are like, whoa, whoa, Aaron, 90, 100? Like, I don't think I'm going to live that long. <laughs> but, you know, it's definitely important to plan for it. I'd, I'd rather see them there and, you know, in good shape than, you know, well, we didn't think you were going to be that old and now you're penniless. Sorry. Aaron, is that why you tell clients that if, if they do live past 90 that they can just live with Ryan? <laughs> this all doesn't work? <laughs> I have plenty of, plenty of room on my couch in my, my very spacious Manhattan <laughs> apartment, believe me. Um, no, but Aaron, that's, that's, that's another good point about longevity and, and running your projections out further, right? Because we are living longer now and it's kind of, it's an important point. Like you need to run your numbers going out a long, long time. You can't just say, well, my parents, they didn't live long, so I'm not going to live long. That doesn't cut it, right? I mean, longevity is one of the biggest issues we have in the modern era, especially with retirement planning. Yeah, I mean, the reality is there are a lot of unknowns, a lot of variables. Everybody's situation is unique and everyone's different. And we really just need to try and be as conservative as possible and plan for all of those things because you never know what's around the corner. The highest odds of success with the least amount of risk. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 91, Hard to Believe, Pain Points of Wealth. We have over 100,000 downloads. Thank you for the support. If you like our podcast, you love our podcast, please give us that five-star rating on iTunes. Leave us a comment. What do you want us to speak about? Anything financially related? If this is on Spotify, please subscribe. And on YouTube, you can give us a like on this actual episode. You can click the subscribe button and click that notification bell so you can be updated every week of all our new content. If you love our podcast, give us the support. That support gives us the ability to continue to do the podcast. Thank you for the support. Hope you're enjoying episode 91. All right, it's the hidden facts of finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, first one to you. With regards to food inflation, margarine experienced the largest percentage price increase. The spread is 34.5 more expensive, percent more expensive than it was last June, and its price leaped up 7% from May to June alone. Does anyone actually use margarine anymore? I was shocked. I think I'm more shocked by that. Well, I was like, one of my clients was a doctor who passed not too long ago, and he told me, he's Bob, in your lifetime, 
you're going to find that everything that you thought was good for you is going to turn out to be bad for you. And everything they told you was bad for you is going to turn out to be good. And I think that was the case with Marjorie, right? I never liked it anyway. I don't care if butter costs a lot more. I'm not going to pay up for margarine no matter what. Well, I guess the rest of America doesn't agree with you, Bob. Someone's using margarine. A lot of margin on margarine. <laughs> wow, Chris. Sounds like a slippery slope <laughs> to me, Chris. <laughs> You're in the wrong profession, Chris. You know, you know you're always a poet. Uh, all right, yeah. Chris. About 60% of working Americans say that the definition of what's considered quote unquote professional has changed since the start of the pandemic. In a recent survey, less than 40% of Gen Zers that work think you need to main, you don't need to maintain a quote unquote conservative appearance in the workplace. That includes keeping tattoos covered. More than 40% of millennials have tattoos, according to IPSO polls published last year, compared with only 13% of baby boomers. Well, I guess Bob probably doesn't have a tattoo then. It's like, <laughs> not too you know, the first uh, uh, up until I worked at Payne Capital Management, I wore a suit every day, and then I walked into my office the first day, and, and my brother, my boss, was wearing a hooded sweatshirt. So yes, I think, <laughs> I think appearances have changed over time. And uh, Dad, don't run out and get that Bitcoin tattoo yet. <laughs> Chris, Chris says he wants to get Bob Coin on one arm and Payne Capital Management logo on his other arm. Well, guess what? Now it's actually acceptable. Congratulations, Chris. You can do it. All right, Aaron, an, an NFT entitled, that's a non-fungible token for all that wonder, called The Merge, is the most expensive in the short history of NFTs, sold for $91.8 million. This artist should have been on Wall Street. Uh, she or he was able to con 30,000 people to put $3,000 each to buy a piece of this art. Like that, that definitely would have been a Wall Street success. This is simply amazing. This is the oldest I've ever felt talking to people about NFTs. I don't get it. You're paying all this money for this digital print that you can just look up on the internet. Listen, Aaron, you just don't get it, okay? You're, you're just not with it. <laughs> so I guess uh, hopefully they weren't one of those 30,000 folks. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Aaron. Yeah, I, I agree. I think you just don't get it. I mean, who wouldn't want a digital, something digital that you could replicate over and over again um, and pay a premium for it but that's completely replicable, you know? I digress. But, you know, it's it's mine. <laughs> but it's yours. That's right. <laughs> good point. Good point. Four, I would have paid 4000 now uh, per piece. <laughs> Bob, cassettes are back. In the U.S., sales have been sharp, have seen sharp gains in recent years. The format nearly doubled from 173,000 total units sold in 2020 to 343,000 units sold last year, and we're already at 215,000 units sold in 2022 on pace to make it another record year. I don't get it. I mean, cassettes were not the best way ever to listen to something with good audio quality, in my experience. Right, cassettes. What are you, out of your mind? You know, I, I spent a whole day when I moved out of our house throwing that stuff away. Not just them, but vinyl, LPs, 35s, cassettes, CDs, 8-tracks. I had them all. You know, I'll take Spotify and iTunes any day of the week. Yeah, but there's just something about that old school mixtape, you know. And I'm sure Chris <laughs> uh, would love to get back to that. And I will say this too, Bob, when it came to audio technology, you were always at the forefront. You were the first person I know that had CDs. I remember you bought Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, David Bowie. And you're like, look, guys, this plays with a laser. And we thought it was just the most futuristic thing we've ever seen. Yeah, and by the way, guys, I, I do use those tapes nowadays. I use them uh, to tie around my shrouds on the sailboat to indicate where the wind is blowing. They're great for that. And you can't find them. Maybe that's why they're uh, coming back in vogue. Everyone's sailing and needs them for their boats, Chris. That's right. It's a big hit by Christopher Cross, sailing. They want to hear that on uh, original tape. I know. I love, I, I, love you. I love you New Yorkers and Philly people. You're driving prices up you know, down in Florida. Keep coming. And, uh, you know, Chris, we're going to keep searching the planet for cassette tape for you so you can keep sailing. All right. Sounds good. I like it. Well, another great show, Aaron, man. Thanks for being with us today. It's always a pleasure to have you. Thanks for having me, guys. It's great. All right. Another great podcast. If you love our podcast, you lust over our podcast, please give us a like. <laughs> give us a five-star rating on iTunes. Give us a comment. Let us know what you want to speak about on this podcast. Go on YouTube. Please give us a like. Give us the notification bell. Hit it so you can be updated every week of all our new content. That's it for this week's. Pain points of wealth, stay loose, and keep an open mind.